All righty. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Richard Schultz. I'm the Cultural Arts Manager. And we are here this evening to deepen our knowledge about arts in cities. And this is part of our ongoing effort to develop an arts and culture plan. It's our 10-year plan that will guide us in terms of programming and uh, related activities to arts and culture. So tonight is uh, part of a three event lineup. Yesterday we did a community workshop and we'll be doing another one tomorrow. At the front table here we have a card which gives you the details of tomorrow at the Senior Center in which we'll be doing a community workshop. Think of it as an opportunity to hear about where we are with the arts and culture plan and to provide some feedback and dialogue about the process and where we're going in the coming months. Um, also at the front table, there's a survey you may have seen. Please, you're more than welcome to take it with you, fill it out, as well as there's some small business cards which give you the information if, you, if you'd like to do it online. So lots of options. Tonight we are, are thrilled to have Lynn Osgood with us. She's with Go Collaborative and she's our consultant working on the arts and culture plan. And uh, she's part of an organization that excels at a number of things in, including creative placemaking. So we thought it was a great opportunity since Lynn would be in town to have her share her insights and her experience on what's happening nationally. So if you would welcome, join me in welcoming Lynn. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all about trends that are happening in arts and cities and how arts are influencing the way that we develop our cities. Because though that's not, nothing new, the way that it's happening now is very different than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so, and a lot of that happens under the guise of creative placemaking. So, so first I just wanted to, to say that you know this is all in the context right now of creating a, an arts and culture plan for Carlsbad. And in that, it's important to, that we recognize that arts and culture are no longer how we traditionally have thought of them as the symphony, the ballet, the traditional arts, the traditional fine arts that maybe we grew up thinking about. That today, it is actually when people talk about arts and culture, they talk about cooking and digital media and sound art and heritage and landscape architecture and really just that broad, broad range of creative industries. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up, I mentioned it uh, just a little bit last night, is that the idea of using the arts in developing our cities is part of our DNA as a nation. We've always had it. And it actually started, we can trace its roots back to when the industrial city came about and uh, 1860s, 70s, 80s, and urban conditions changed radically. It was at that time that civic associations started to form, to start to address. We've always had that as part of who we are. That's always been charted historically as who we are as a nation. But in America, we do it really well. And these civic associations started to come together here in Carlsbad, many, to improve the city. As the library and helping downtown, helping State Street. A lot of these associations then developed into arts association, realizing that the arts could be used to contribute to the way to make the cities better. This is Grand Central Station in New York City, um, and it was the Municipal Arts Society in 18, uh, that started in 1893 that helped to create the mural that if you've ever stood in Grand Central Station and looked up, it's this exquisite mural of the constellations. And without the Municipal Arts Society, we would not have that mural, which is such an integral part to that experience of being in Grand Central Station. And they had a lovely phrase as they looked to help the arts create the city. They said, we cannot love our city unless we make our city lovely. And this was their rallying cry. And today we have the same evolution of that energy and those ideas here um, and across the United States. 
But whereas I think traditionally we think of the arts as we help to create our cities in things like commemorative statues, this is FDR, the FDR Memorial, or even contemporary murals. This is one of, I love this one, this is in Glasgow. This is a patron, patron saint, uh, much like a Saint Francis, but in contemporary clothes. Um, though we think about um, civic art, art that helps contribute to our cities as murals or statues, the conversation really within the last, I would even say eight years, has shifted radically. And it has turned to a field called creative placemaking. Now, for people who are architects or designers or engineers, people who have always done placemaking, they're, they're a little bit taken back that now the arts field is suddenly calling it creative placemaking. <laughs> that they think it's always been creative, and it has. But what's different is that now artists are right in the middle of the conversations about how cities get built. It's not coming at the end of the equation. It's not that the street is built and then the piece of art comes. But the artists are there from the beginning. And so what this means is that the artists have to be in partnership with nonprofits, with municipalities, looking for larger philanthropic dollars that's going to help fund these partnerships that's going to create new ways of thinking. Artists are most often used in terms of thinking of bringing innovation to the equation and of bringing deep engagement, things that often city projects have problems bringing to the fore, but that artists are so good at. And so the way to think about this, I, lo I love this phrase, is that art is not a flower, but it's a wrench. It's no longer a, just a noun, just a thing, but it's a verb, it's something we do. And so to, it, I think it, to, to help understand this, it helps to tell a story. And so the story is how this all got started about eight years ago or so was with a man named Rocco Landesman, who was the director of the NEA. Now Rocco Landesman was the producer of the Broadway show, The Producers. So when he came to the NEA, he really understood how to bootstrap a project. He knew how to get money to the table to make something happen. And what he saw when he talked with the other heads of federal agencies was that Housing and urban development had funding for the arts, transportation had funding for the arts, but the arts budget, the federal arts budget, was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So he said, you know what, we, we've got to change this conversation. We can't keep doing it as we traditionally have. Because so often, traditionally, the arts were viewed as the frosting on the cake. We have to make people understand that it's one of the ingredients of the cake itself. And so what he did was that he, start, he created a program called Our Town. And the Our Town program man, uh, gave out about quarter million dollar grants to artists who were explicitly working with cities in partnership to further a community development goal of some sort. It could be physical, it could be the creation of a park, it could be working with a health and human service agency. It could be, it, whatever it was, it was defined by the municipal partner. And so, um, and so what that did is then that, the, that program actually spawned another philanthropic organization called Art Place America. They are now a consortium of Rockefeller, Ford, Kresge, Serdna, three national banks. And they're working, they're gonna sunset in 2020, but they're working as hard as they can to, to have these funding ideas go farther and further sort of down the, the philanthropic stream, so to speak. So whereas now it's Rockefeller and Ford, the conversation is now coming to local uh, philanthropic organizations. And they are giving out hundreds of millions of dollars. And so what's in, part of the reason why, why cities are really going, are bringing artists into the equation of city making is that there's philanthropic money out there that really wants to see this happen because they know that the arts can thrive in contexts that are not traditional. So what I want to do tonight is just tell you four stories. Four stories. These are case studies. Um, so one of the things that my firm did about five years now was we worked with the NEA to create an online portal called Exploring Our Town, which did 70 case studies of projects all over the US that explicitly involved artists working with cities to, to further the city's goals for the development. And I chose four case studies that I thought would just be good, good conversations here in Carlsbad. So the first one I wanted to identify, uh, for, talk about was Whirly Gig Park in Wilson, North Carolina. 
And the reason I chose this was because I, I love this example, an example of a community finding what its cultural core is, working hard to try and identify that. And what it came, so Wilson, North Carolina, um, just to give you the background story, five, about 50,000 people population outside of, east of Raleigh. Um, it was a major tobacco area, but then when the federal tobacco buyout came, the international tobacco buyers left and the economy of the town crashed and 20% of the people now are under the poverty level and b buildings were vacant and they had to, they were trying to figure out who are we in this equation and what do we do for our economy? Well, in their midst was a man, Volus Simpson, a World War II veteran who was a machinist, who worked as a machinist in the area, who happened in his spare time to make these whirly gigs. And, um, and they were wonderful contraptions really just of his own invention that he really just kept to himself on his property, but that didn't go anywhere. The town realized, this is our treasure. This is who we are. This is our scrappiness. This is, this is Mr. Simpson right there. And so what they did was that they, they, did, they formed a partnership, and the partners were the Wilson Downtown Properties, the North Carolina Arts Association, the city of Wilson. They also brought in the National Parks Foundation, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Smithsonian. And what they did was they said, we have a national treasure. We have a national treasure in vernacular art. And we want to put Wilson on the map, not just for the whirly gigs, but for how it is that we can bring integrity to the preservation process. And so they worked with the Smithsonian, they worked with the National Park System, and they developed techniques for restoring the whirly gigs. And not only that, but they worked with local so uh, social service agencies to do job training and job development. They actually created 17 part-time jobs and two full-time jobs out of this project. And they, um, eventually they brought, they brought um, all the whirly gigs to one site and, restore, and now they have restored most of them. And they have deve developed new standards and protocol for vernacular art restoration. And they have, um, in, they have gotten more grants to help create a downtown park that is specifically centered around these whirly gigs. They now bring in 50,000 people a year as visitors. And just in the first couple of years, they, um, well, no, they estimated that in 10 years that they would bring in an additional $40 million into the economy of the town just by restoring their own treasure, their vernacular treasure. And I think Carlsbad has such high standards for everything they're, they're doing. I just, I love the story of them raising the bar for vernacular art. Okay, the other one, the uh, uh, second one that I wanted to talk about was um, Art Prize in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm, I'm curious if anyone has ever heard of it. You have. Have you been there? Have you experienced it? I, I lived uh, right here in Grand Rapids. Oh, so, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, did you ever visit it or? No. Okay. I think I when they started it, yeah. It was, um, well, and you can tell us about Grand Rapids. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a lovely town. Um, you know, it's experienced, like, like most post-industrial cities, it experienced that sort of evacuation of downtown. It was a car culture. Um, even though, you know, it had very walkable city, uh, very walkable areas, but but like most of us in the 90s, we were very car, very car, or our cities were very car oriented. And so an entrepreneur, uh, Rick DeVos, who, who is related to our uh, education secretary, Betsy DeVos, um, I think he's their son-in-law or something like that, um, decided, you know what, we, we need to bring art downtown to, make de to give people a reason to walk downtown and to expose people to contemporary art. So what they did was they created a radical program, a, a radically inclusive program, where anyone could come and propose, not accept, but propose an idea to put in a public space in downtown Grand Rapids. And our prize helped to coordinate it. But this is the thing, they didn't curate it. What they did was they formed kind of like a dating app they created an application where artists could upload their work, examples of their work, and if you were a public space downtown, you could select one of the artists to display. 
And, and so it wasn't, so Art Prize did not curate. Art Prize handled the advertising. They worked, they worked closely with the city to help make sure that everything was coded correctly. They worked with the Downtown Association to help welcome the artist. Um, and, but it was only the people that wanted specific works of art that would bring them to their spaces. Well, when the first couple years that they started this, they brought 250,000 new visitors to the city. Now they bring half a million every year. It's up for a few months. And, um, and it, it's exposure to contemporary art. And again, wherever space you have, and it can, it can be a traditional gallery, it could be a, an organization that will open up its doors to people. I love this image. The winner gets $200,000. So there's a cash prize incentive. But what I love is, is that it is radically democratic. It is just distributed. If, if a shop owner wants a piece of art, they can choose which one they want. They bring it in. And then Art Prize will then help with all the logistics, the marketing. And, and the walking path that goes between the pieces is just chalk. It's just chalk on the ground. And so. Um, so the third one I, I want to do a lot of is uh, senior uh, partnering with seniors in New York City. A lot of these, pro yeah. Can you, tell, can you tell us a little bit about the funding for the art prize? For the art prize? Yeah. So it was started, yeah, that's a good question. It was started by uh, Rick DeVos, who, who did come from Means, and he was an entrepreneur. So he was able to bring that capital. They also partnered with the Kresge Foundation. And, um, and that allowed them the initial startup capital. But then a lot of what they do then is work with sponsorships that, that will help because they draw in so many visitors that that has become a significant uh, income stream. But the start of it was, um, did, did need that infusion of capital of the entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And so are the artists, do the artists um, pay for their own Um, I do believe that they help the, the, the artists get there and get installed, but then there's, um, and then the artists can sell their work. But the materials and all, because some of the, what we just saw was mm -hmm. fairly expensive to put together, I mean relatively. Right, yeah. So the artists found So, the yeah, so no, it's not, it's not commissioned work. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's the opportunity to show the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then sell the work, so. Mm. Yeah, any other questions? They're great questions. What's the period? How long? Three months. Three months. Yeah. I think March, April, May. Okay. So the, the next one, the third one, is uh, partnering with seniors in New York City. And this one I like because it's, it's just a lovely, um, it's a lovely partnership between the New York City Department of, Agents, uh, of Aging and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And so New York City's population is aging, like all cities' population is aging. And in a few years, one out of every five New Yorkers will be a senior. And um, the majority of those seniors will also be under the poverty level, so that they will not have access to arts and cultural amenities. And, um, but the city does have senior centers in all five boroughs. And they bring the, about 7,000 seniors pass through their doors every day. And so what they, what they realized was that artists in New York were desperate for space. Our New York real estate is New York real estate. And if you need a studio, you just, it can be too expensive. So what they did was, but senior centers often had space. So they formed a, uh, a partnership where the artists would have an artist in residency. And um, they worked with 50 artists in all five boroughs. And they put out a call for applications. Uh, a few hundred artists applied. And then what they did was they worked with the, art, uh, the arts councils in each of the districts to select the artists. So the artists that would make most sense for Staten Island, for the Bronx, for Brooklyn, to work with their particular seniors. And then the artist established a residency and then worked with, uh, worked with the seniors. And they did dance and performance and storytelling. They had, uh, in the course of a year, they had um, 212 um, public events 
and performances. And, you know, exercise class was now much more lively. And um, they started changing their physical environment because of the artists being there. <coughs> and, uh, and what I love, uh, one artist worked with seniors to make, uh, worked with folks to make just small por porcelain cups, but they're kiln busted. And so they actually formed an Etsy page and sold the cups and bought a new kiln. So, which was a lovely, lovely partnership. So that's a sweet one. Okay, the last one I wanted to show was the Market Street Prototyping Festival. And the Prototyping Festival, the reason that I wanted to show this one was because um, Carlsbad has such a, a thriving business culture. And business thrives on innovation. And, um, and this is one where there was a really a beautiful partnership between the Yerba, Bruce, Yerba Buena Cultural Center and Arts Center and, um, and the planning department. And when you talk to the people involved, what was so interesting about this partnership was that it wasn't that just the, the cultural center decided, hey, we have an idea, city, will you help us with permitting? It was a vision that was shared absolutely side by side with the planning department and the cultural organization. And that vision was that they wanted to radically rethink Market Street. Market Street, which ran through the city, but that just did not feel very engaging. So the city wanted to come up with new ideas, new ways, that ideas that people could re-engage on the street. The arts organization wanted to support artists and come up with some really good ways and really push the envelope for how people could think about this. So this was the vision that they wanted to get to, a, a new vision for Market Street, but they didn't want to do the, the typical planning process because we all know how painful that was. And so they are planning, but in a radically different way. And they're planning by first thinking of, let's just think completely outside the box. Let's think in radically different ways. We may never actually have these as street furniture, but you know, but we're gonna experiment with different ways that we can come together on the city streets, be with each other, talk with each other, and spark some ideas, some conversations that are going to open up the conversation for what Market Street can be, rather than assuming that just the best practices are gonna answer the question of what it needs to be. And so artists, um, so they um, did, a, did a call for, for proposals. They got a, a couple hundred submissions. They, um, they worked with many of them. This is one where if you sit here and stand there, you have to sit and stand in certain configurations, and then the, the fountain will, will spurt. And so, but you have to figure it out, which means that you're going to have to talk with a stranger to get, that, to get the piece to work. And just beautiful and delightful, fun ways. Um, I love this one of just start a game of ping pong <laughs> with your new friend on the street. Um, have a different experience. And just think of the street in a new way. Think of the street through the eyes of a choreographer, a musician, an artist. As an urban planner, I know that, they, that it, that's different thinking. And this one I had to show because this is actually one that is made by the San Francisco Library in coordination with the uh, Public Works Department. So this was their installation. So as, as I mentioned before, these um, creative placemaking is all over the United States now. It's in rural, tribal, mid-sized cities, small cities, dense urban cities. People are really looking and saying that art can take a radically different role in how we develop. And so if you're interested, this is the website that we developed. Um, it has two sides. It has the project showcase and the project insights. And in the project showcase, there are, there's over 70 case studies. Um, it was a project that nearly killed us, but it was, it was a wonderful project to do. Um, and, and just all sorts of stories of different ways that cities are, are working in collaboration with artists to, make, to, to further everyone's goals. All right. Well, thank you all. Well, thank, thank you, you all, all for being Kelly. here. Really appreciate it. Mm.